Nice to meet you. Yeah. Thanks for having me on. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, could you please introduce yourself and Story Protocol and why you found Story Protocol? Absolutely. So I'm Jason. I'm one of the co-founders at Story. And uh, my background is actually in AI. So I graduated from Stanford with two degrees, one in philosophy mm -hmm. and the other in computer science. And the computer science degree was a master's degree focused on artificial intelligence. So after I graduated, I was the youngest product manager at DeepMind. And my role there was taking the research behind uh, AlphaGo, which, you know, played Lisa Dahl in mm -hmm. Go, uh, AlphaZero, as well as other game playing agents like the AIs that would, you know, beat the world leaders in chess and in StarCraft as well, and find ways to take that AI research and apply it to real world mm -hmm. problems, find ways to take that, you know, interesting but not useful AI and actually make it useful for consumers. So that was my job uh, at DeepMind. And one of the interesting things I noticed there, or the interesting opportunity there, is that at DeepMind, we had a lot of the, you know, really powerful language models as well. And so before ChatGPT was even released, I was able to see, almost see the future, right? Because other people, you know, average person would not be able to access this technology before ChatGPT came out. But I was able to see some of the opportunities and challenges. And what I, what I noticed was that, you know, at the end of the day, my belief was this sort of AI is going to get faster. It's going to get more powerful. It's going to get cheaper. But the biggest question that no one seemed to be able to answer is how do we actually do this sustainably? Because you can, you know, at DeepMind yeah. and other companies, you know, you can train on common crawl, you can train on the entire internet, but then how do you actually keep uh, incentives for creators to continue creating what they're doing, right? So True. you're starting to see a lot of issues, but I saw that very early. And so uh, around that time, I got into blockchain as well, um, because, you know, around DeFi summer, I started rereading the Bitcoin and Ethereum white papers. I had, uh, for a while, I had been mining Dogecoin in like middle <laughs> yeah, school yeah. or high school, but that was more of just for fun because, yeah. uh, you know, I couldn't buy video games. So oh. <laughs> yeah, I was I was disabled from the uh, monetary oh, system because yeah, of my yeah. parents, so I had to find money <laughs> online, right? But but I started seriously looking at blockchain uh, around 20, 20, 21 and reading these white papers. And, you know, the research to production cycle is so much faster in blockchain. In AI, yeah. it can take many, many even decades to get mm -hmm. to research to production. In blockchain, you know, with Uniswap, it was white paper, protocol, fork, you know, apps building on top all in months. And that was very exciting. And then also the philosophy behind uh, blockchain, I found very exciting because I was, you know, interested in philosophy as well. And so all the combination of those things, just seeing kind of some of the issues around IP and AI, and then also getting more interested in blockchain, both from the research and from the philosophy perspective, made me feel like it was really exciting time to build in blockchain. And, and to be honest, there hadn't been any use cases for blockchain outside of money, right? It was just Bitcoin, it was stable coins, it was DeFi, but then, you know, most people don't spend all their time thinking about investment or, or finance or, or money. They spend their time thinking about content on TikTok or content on, on Spotify or Apple Music. And so... Uh, I just thought there was a lot of opportunity. Um, and so I quit DeepMind. I, I didn't have any plans. I just, you know, for a few months was just working on random ideas. Ended up meeting SY and, you know, obviously very successful entrepreneur in Korea and had a lot of experience with media from a like entrepreneurship perspective, right? Yeah. I had just been thinking yeah. about it from the AI perspective. And then uh, it was just kind of very obvious that we had a similar vision. So that's kind of how I got into blockchain, how I met SY and how story started. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Um, so... You just uh, told us about how you found Story Protocol. And so can you introduce what is Stor Story Protocol to our uh, viewers, please? Yeah, so Story is building the world's IP blockchain. And really what that means is basically we are building a layer one that allows you to on-ramp intellectual property, whether that's uh, a song or whether that's a work of art or whether that's even an AI model or uh, someone's voice or likeness or image. We're uploading that on-chain. And not just bringing it on chain, because obviously you can bring media on chain, right? But really turning it from just a media, static media file to programmable IP. And what that really means is now you can register your IP and actually set the terms for how other people can use that content on, on any other platform, including the terms for how AI can train on it. So before you just had, you know, on the internet, you think about Instagram, right? It's a, it's a media file that you're looking at. And if you wanted to use like a picture from Instagram, how do you know, how, how much do I pay? Can I even use this at all? Where can I use this? Um, and if I generate revenue, like how much percentage do I have to pay to the, you don't have any of those questions answered, right? So yeah. now you have content, sure, but content is static and, uh, the internet is not static, right? The internet, there's always retweets, quote tweets, there's remixes. Now with AI, anyone can create high quality content, but it's still static. And so we have no idea how to actually sustainably make use of this. So our thesis is 
actually by bringing uh just like just like what DeFi did for money was take a physical dollar bill yeah. and put it on chain and make it programmable so now you have this ecosystem of DeFi. Mm -hmm. can we do that for content mm -hmm. and so we built out not just layer one but also a smart contract proof of creativity protocol on top of the layer one to sort of enable you to on-ramp ip make mm -hmm. it programmable set the terms and allow any application to use a single piece of content in a composable way okay thank you uh you just said that you cho choose to develop as a layer one um, these days, uh, projects are opting to build on layer two or layer three. Why did you choose to build as a layer one project? Yeah, it's a great question. So uh, I wrote about this a little bit um, in our recent fundraising announcement, but really the journey to, to the current tech stack is really a long journey and it spanned a, a series of pivots that have lasted throughout the entire company, basically. So uh, when, when we start, started Story, it was really with the idea of let's build a single IP franchise mm -hmm. using blockchain tools and let's try to make it really big and, and showcase what's possible with uh -huh. blockchain technology. But it was very obvious within, I would say even weeks of working on that, that there's so much tooling that hadn't been built, right? So yeah. for example, like I think a lot of collections have, have, you know, moved IP rights or try to move IP rights on chain. But then if I want to license some, IP, some media file I found, I found on Zora or something, right? Mm -hmm. How do I actually do that? Well, I need to go read some legal contract. I need a lawyer and then I need to find the other person that I want, yeah. um, to, to do a deal with. And then he probably has to have a lawyer. She probably has to have a lawyer. And so we're just back to the old system. So it's, it's basically imagine if, if I wanted to trade a token on Uniswap, I had to go call my banker and then find the other person to trade with. And then they had to call their banker. Mm -hmm. I mean, that makes no sense. At, at that point, you might as well not use use blockchain, right? Yeah, true. So uh, we realized that we needed to build like the proof of creativity protocol. Uh, uh -huh. And so we built this set of smart contracts that allows you to on-ramp IP. But then we started supporting, you know, different partners on different chains in, in testnet. And it, it became kind of very high friction to have to create uh, uh, composable IPs across different chains, right? Because now you have to do many, many different uh, uh, multi-chain communications and cross-chain communications. Yeah. So, uh, and some of that IP wasn't even on chain. So you had mm -hmm. off-chain IP, you had you know, let's say something on Solana, you have something on Ethereum, you have something on, let's say, uh, like an optimism. And now you want to build a story with characters from each of those four environments. And now it's, you know, like extremely difficult and risky, right? Mm -hmm. And so we thought, okay, we should own our own block space. We should oh, have our own. So we actually, you know, L2 obviously on Ethereum is the easiest way to spin up your own block space. So we actually did that. Mm -hmm. And we had some, you know, OP stack layer two, and we deployed our protocol on the layer two, and we were asking people to use it. And we had a lot of partners switch over um, because, you know, it's all EVM equivalent. And mm -hmm. uh, that was that was fine for a very short period of time. But then very quickly, we realized that the standard um, virtual machine mm -hmm. is just not execution environment is just not designed mm -hmm. for graph traversal. And if you think about IP, it's structured in the same way as uh, open source code or social media profile, where you have this very graph like structure. But we're not just tracking this, you know, what IP is related to what in this graph. We're actually trying to uh, transmit value, right? So if someone makes money on one end of the graph, then, you know, you, you know that, that IP can have 30 different nodes that's connected to it. Yeah, so yeah. now you need to, okay, now you need to flow these royalties to 30 different nodes. Uh -huh. But then each of those 30 nodes may have 30 nodes yeah. themselves. So, so you're just doing, you know, exponential uh, explosion in computation. So yeah. we actually, during the phase when we were briefly experimenting with an L2, we had to limit the number of parents uh -huh. or connections for, uh, for each IP to two, which is ridiculous. That just means like you can't do anything like Super Smash Bros. You can't do something like the Avengers where you actually want to have, you know, tens if not hundreds of different IPs linking in, right? So yeah. Uh, it became pretty clear that the best way to to do this was re to redesign the entire stack from the bottom up and own every single part of the stack, right? And that's not just to solve the problem I just mentioned. It's also to future-proof the solution. Mm -hmm. um, and, and just to be very clear, we're not trying to compete against Solana. We're not trying to compete against Ethereum. To be honest, like you can use Story Protocol without knowing what blockchain is, right? We, we've built yeah. an API that just allows you to call it like a any other API, like a Stripe API mm -hmm. or like a Twilio API. Um, a lot of Web2 partners use us and they don't have to worry about any of the complexities of the blockchain. So ultimately, like, you know, there's this whole dialogue of like layer one battle or whatever. It's really not like for us a zero sum game. It's like a lot of the people we're trying to support are off chain and they don't, they mm -hmm. really don't care what L1, right? It's, so it's like, are, is my website hosted on the US? Is it hosted on Microsoft Azure? Is it hosted on Google Cloud? The average person doesn't care and they shouldn't. True. And so our, our philosophy is like, let's just make this work and mm -hmm. hopefully it can solve some problems for creators and, and applications. And then, um, you know, it seems like the layer one gives us the most flexibility, right? So. Oh yeah. Um, so that's the reason why you built layer one to solve the problems in the IP industry. So. The 
thing that I'm curious about is that you've mentioned that Story Protocol allows creator creators to build their IP on chain and monetize. Could you please um, explain about this process, how they could put their IP on chain and uh, give monetization to them? Yeah, so this is sort of the idea of IP Legos, right? And yeah. it's actually quite simple at a high level. Basically, we built an on-chain repository or like a, I think about it like a, a, a registry for IP. And so we've defined a standard data format for IP, like what defines an IP on-chain, right? Mm -hmm. What kind of metadata? And a lot of that metadata is focused around licensing rights and, and royalty rights. So basically think about like almost a drop-down menu of on-chain parameters that, that expresses and declares uh, using software programmatically how you want other people to use your IP. So mm -hmm. do you need to pay me at all? Do you need to pay me? If so, do you need to pay me one, uh, you know, one, uh, USDC? Do you need to pay me 10? Do you need to pay me a thousand? Uh, also, after you've, you know, paid me to obtain a license to use this, then, you know, if you make revenue using that license, then how much do you, like, do you pay me some percentage recurring, right? So all these sorts of terms are registered on story. And then, then we've built out modules, like a licensing module or royalties module, dispute module that enable functionality for the IPs, um, based on the terms that they've set. Right. So it's a combination of states and, and functions, um, to, to be overly simplistic, but that's, that's how story works at a high level on the protocol side, mm -hmm. on the smart contract side. Excuse me. Um, and then, uh, basically we've built an API around that set of functionality. So mm -hmm. even if you're not a smart contract developer, you can still build web applications, uh, yeah. on top of the, the tools that we built. Um, so you mentioned about the revenue distribution side of the, um, story protocol. So I'm just curious about um, how could Story Protocol ensure that revenue gen generated from the AI contents of the or the co mix of the contents is fairly distributed from the uh, original content creator and those who remix and build up on that original contents. So what mechanisms and standards are there in the on the Story Protocol to guarantee the equitable compensation for them? Yeah, so it's a really good question. The way that we think about building story uh -huh. is we're building a neutral protocol. So we're not mm -hmm. trying to build an algorithm that scans the internet and then decides, well, okay, based on the number of likes you've got or the views you've got, then this IP gets $10 or, you know, 10 USDC mm -hmm. or the other one gets, you know, however many amount of value. That's, that's not really up to us to decide. We're just building a neutral protocol, right? Same, same thing with Uniswap. It's not determining yeah. the price. Uniswap does not determine the price of the tokens, right? The market, um, in, in the, the buyer, buyers and the sellers, on either side of a liquidity pool, they uh -huh. determine the price, right? Yeah, so we're true. building like the neutral structure. And our philosophy is that creators or the owners of the IP should set their terms. Mm -hmm. And so if I set, if I think my work of art is amazing and I'm pricing it at, you know, 10 X the, the real value, then no one's going to use it. Right. So then over time, the market forces will push the creator to set the price lower yeah. or, uh, applications can, can give suggestions to the creators. They say, okay, well, you know, we have some algorithm as an app that, and we know on the back end that typically artists like you or your historical performance is that you should price your IP like this. Or maybe there's some sort mm -hmm. of auction, like an IP5, D5 sort of thing where there's an auction to price an IP. So our goal is let, let, let people be able to register IP on story, uh, be able to compose on top of it, monetize it. And just like with DeFi, there's no, there's no algorithm that determines the price of a token, right? There, some apps might use a bonding curve. Some apps might use, you know, some sort of, uh, AMM, but at the end of the day, it's a, it's a market-based system. And so that's the same way on story as well. Oh, so the users should decide by themselves to, or, or via an app, right? uh, oh, like friend tech. Or via, yeah. you know, no, I'm not just, I mean, unfortunately I'm not deciding <laughs> the price of my friend tech keys, which are yeah, low, true. but, um, uh, yeah, friend tech has some mechanism, right? Mm -hmm. And that's different from the way that, uh, a token is priced on Uniswap, which yeah, is true. completely based on, you know, their AMM and also arbitraging across, you know, other AMMs and, and mm -hmm. centralized exchanges. So, um, any app can build their own logic as well. Just like a key on, uh, you know, a key on Frentech is going to be priced based on Frentech's logic. So this is a further question and um, I'll give you a scenario which like, suppose someone uses a uh, derivative content or some IPs built on story protocol to sell products like t-shirts or like merchandises or toys. So what incentive do you uh, they have to report their sales on Story Protocol. And if they don't, how do you plan to address these kinds of untracked monetizations? Yeah, so yeah. great question. I'll break it down into two parts. Uh -huh. So the first part is what happens if people actually are good 
and they they want to go down the happy path of you know mm-hmm. uh, compensating the creators that they like and and whose creativity that they're taking advantage of. The second is what happens when they're they're bad and they're trying to take advantage of the system. So there's a lot of reasons. That, you know, obviously in in the blockchain space, we like to focus on worst case scenario, and that's actually a really good design principle is to always prepare for the worst. But I think it's often underlooked, like how often most people are not actually ninety nine percent of people even in a blockchain environment, are, are not necessarily bad actors, right? Um, yeah. Obviously, 1% can make all the difference, but you look at a business in like a Getty Images or mm-hmm. a Shutterstock, mm-hmm. right? Like where you can get photographs. Anyone can easily screen, like right-click, save as, like a Getty Images, right? But yeah. why does the New York Times pay, you know, thousands of dollars to obtain these photos? Well, the New York Times has bigger problems to worry about. They, they're not trying to save $1,000 and then get sued down the line, right? So uh, ultimately, these businesses are each worth multi-billion dollars, right? Getty is worth over $3 billion. Shutterstock is many billions of dollars. And, and you know, uh, the whole time there's a way for, I can I can totally use their images without paying for them, right? If I wanted to. So uh, you can still build many billion dollars of value just by having people, making it easier for people to do the right thing, right? Like Getty makes it extremely easy. On a single platform, of course, it's not composable like with Story, but it makes it extremely easy for you to do the right thing. And so what Story is doing is, you know, on one hand, on the happy path, it's making it extremely easy for applications to make one single API call and stream all the revenues. They don't have to worry about endless paperwork and, and, you know, hiring a lawyer and all the things that prevent apps from doing the right thing, right? And also, um, you know, they, they also don't want to get into legal trouble, especially if you're building a business. So if we give people a really easy way to do the right thing, most people will try to stay out of, you know, any, any conflicts and they'll be incentivized to compensate the creators and creators as well would not want to use an app that doesn't, you know, pay them mm-hmm. the, 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 the terms that they've stated. So I would say there's actually like a lot of apps that, that do want to take the, the, low friction route mm-hmm. if that low friction route is available which story does and we even have apps like ablo that are doing that with fashion brands today so it's like a physical merch where you have a p- partnership with like a balenciaga or a balmain and um you're using generative ai to create like artwork that you can then put on these shoes and then you know all the licensing will be powered by story right so we already do have those instances of off-chain revenues and we've built an api to funnel off-chain revenue into the on-chain smart contract so that's the happy path but of course the interesting thing to consider is you know not everyone is is going to follow that and we should have backup plan. So there's sort of two levels of how do we handle the, the unhappy path. Mm-hmm. The first is on chain. And uh, I briefly mentioned this before, but we've built out a dispute module. So the dispute module allows anyone, any on chain actor to flag an IP as you know, infringing their terms, right? Whether they're not paying their royalties or whether they're copying someone else's work and pretending it's theirs, um, you can you can create a dispute and that pushes you to an arbitration policy of basically reviewing that dispute. If that review is successful, then basically that IP would stop being able to earn royalties, stop being able to commercialize. And of course, it's all on-chain data. So now any developer can filter out other IPs owned by that actor uh, if they wanted to. We're not in charge of taking things off of story because that's our Mm -hmm. whole ethos. But like, we give people the information and developers the information to know, hey, maybe I don't want to feature this person on, on my website, right? And so that's the first level of defense. But then the second level of defense is that even if everything else goes wrong, we've built a programmable IP license. And that's a real legal contract that backs every single deal, every single licensing deal on story. And we we think that's really important because um, at the end of the day, if everything goes wrong, the worst case scenario on story is the best case scenario in the real world, right? Which is that you have to go through this legal system. Yeah. And so even though that's the worst case scenario, it's a very important backstop. Just like with USDC, like in the worst case scenario, you can obviously just convert it to US dollars, right? It's yeah, a very true. important backstop. And we think that being able to bridge code and law is an important part of what makes creators comfortable with story. And and to be honest, like just being pragmatic, if, if you have an IP that blows up uh, on story and you want to go to Disney and, and have them make a movie out of it, they're not going to, you know, they're not going to mm-hmm. look at the on-chain record, they're going to look at the license, right? And so we want to give creators the opportunity to have that power as well. So you talked about the programmable IP license, which this um, is related to the legal complexity. Yeah, yeah. So uh, like Story Protocol promotes openness and collaboration for IP owners, but this could really potentially conflict with existing copyrights, uh, especially when like different countries have varying copyright regulations. And how is... Story protocol going to solve these by pro- programs or codes or things 